Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this series where I go through my Curse of Strahd for Shadow Dark campaign uh, and do recaps and talk about my prep. This is part 13, so really we're getting along with this thing. Uh, we've actually played quite a few times since my last video. My last video was back in February, and we've played a lot, basically every week since then, or a couple weeks off, but really it's been quite a bit. So we've covered a lot in the campaign. I'll try to cover it all today, because the players have gone through the Abbey of St. Markovia entirely. They went back to Valaki, they spent a little time there, and then they went, in our very last session, they went to uh, the Castle Ravenloft, and that's where we left off our last session. So I'll try to cover all of that, and then talk about the prep that I did for both the Abbey and, or, or how the Abbey turned out, but then also what I've done for Ravenloft itself. And, and if you've seen my other videos on Ravenloft and how I was going to prepare it, I took some of that, and then I modified it a bit, and I took, well, you'll see. But basically, uh, I'll run through what we did up until this point in the campaign. Try to try to do it relatively briefly, <laughs> because there's a lot to cover. Essentially, uh, after Yester Hill, the players made their way with their new ally Titus, and they had rescued Esmeralda, um, and they also had uh, brother Kylan, who they had rescued from the sacrifice there. They brought them all back with them to the, uh, to the city of Kresik. Oh, and Abner was with them, the Watcher of Kresik. They brought them all back. And when they returned, Kresik was a very different place. I mean, they'd been gone basically a day or so uh, with, from their travels, but it was totally foggy. There were no guards at the gate. Things had been abandoned. They got back during the night, or early night, like you know, early in the evening, or I guess early in the night. It was after, oh no, it was after midnight, I think. Anyway, there was nobody around. And uh, there were a couple doors and there were, there were a couple uh, houses with lights. And so Abner rushed to them and yelled at the people in there, what's going on, what's going on? They wouldn't respond. They wouldn't open the door to him. And so... He was uh, you know, worried, <laughs> and Brother Kylan was like, we need to get to the Abbey. We need to leave right now. We need to go to the Abbey. But Esmeralda was really weak and tired from her, um, from her time at the tree, having been drained by it, and other characters were weak as well, and they wanted to spend at least one night in town, and so they said, well, we'll just try to find what's going on. We'll try to find a safe place and rest the night. So the party split up, which was the last time... No, not the last time they split up, but it's one of the last times I think they split up the whole campaign. They decided to stick together after that point. And some of them went to find some of the Watchers, Abner's, uh, you know, underlings. And the others tried to go to their safe house. Well, both of them ran into vampires. In the night, they both ran into vampires. And Titus got to try his new trick, which is Fireball. He, they, leveled up after their, um, they leveled up after their fight at Yester Hill. And he got the spell Fireball. And he rolled for his talent. He got advantage on a spell he knows. And so he picked Fireball. So now he has advantage on casting Fireball going to be very useful moving forward. Well, he used it right away. They found the vampire. He rolled, and he rolled a natural 20 for his for his first casting of Fireball uh, at advantage. I think he rolled like an 18, and then he rolled a natural 20. So he critted, which means he can double the numerical, one of the numerical modifiers associated with the spell. Now, I ruled it that you can double either the dice, the number of dice, or the, the size of the die, right? So it's 4d6 in Shattered Dark. I said you can either roll 8d6 or 4d12 for your spell just to give the players a choice for, you know, for that sort of damage to them. Uh, and, uh, and so he said, well, okay, um, <laughs> I'm going to, I think he picked 8d6. And he rolled really high, and so he incinerated the vampire the one, one shot, but it set the house that they were in on fire. And so it was like this great moment of, like, he casts it as a reflex. Now, he's, his background is that he's this Imperial War Mage, who, uh, the reason he's leveling up and getting more spells is that he has all of his magic when he left the, the the imperium essentially when he left the 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 military the they put these enchanted wards around his mind to keep him from casting his spells you know because once he's no longer in the military they don't want this rogue war mage running around so they put these wards around his mind and the wards are breaking down in barovia and so he's able to access his old spells again and i thought that was a really cool way of doing a character who was more experienced than his level might indicate although he's level five now but still, it was a really cool moment where he's like, he breaks through the ward and he casts Fireball again and he realizes something's really, really wrong. And well, he already knows something's really wrong in Barovia, but there's something very magically wrong in Barovia too because his wards are weakening. So it was a cool moment and it was very cinematic. He also has Misty Step and so he like blew up the house and then Misty stepped out to the street and he like threw the smoke and it was just really cool. Uh, the players, the other two players with him got singed a bit, but they escaped. And it was really kind of like, okay, this is the guy we just brought in because Titus was brand new for the last session. And so like, this is the kind of guy that we now have in our party, this, this bomb and go around. And he's very dangerous. Fireball is something that he has to be careful about because, um, because we're not playing with a battle map, we're playing much more, um, you know, theater of the mind. 
And the player's really good at narrative, uh, just narrative gameplay and role-playing his character well. And so he he isn't using Fireball, you know, as a solution to every problem. He's and he, and he is very willing to be like, okay, if I cast Fireball, I recognize that I might catch myself or my or my allies or make it very difficult for us because I'll set the room on fire or something. Like he's he's good about knowing if I'm gonna throw a grenade into a room, I have to be careful. So he's uh, he's good about that. And the, the nice thing about Fireball and Shadow Dark is that 4d6 is a lot of damage, but it's not, like, game-breaking a lot of damage. 4d6 is a lot of damage for most low-level creatures, but against higher-level creatures, it's not going to kill them in a hit or something like that. So um, I, I don't, I'm not worried about the damage output that he can do. It's cool, and I'm glad that they have a high damage output, but it's not the end of the world. And, it, and if they lose it, it's also not the end of the world. If he, if he, if he does happen to roll, you know, two, two fails in a, in a row on his advantage cast... Then he just, he loses the spell, and that's that. It would be a, a serious blow to them, but it wouldn't be the end of the world. So anyway, the other group of the part, the other group went to uh, their safe house, and they were, um, they were approached, basically, a vampire was stalking them on the rooftops, and he crawled down onto the street and walked over to them, and then they, it was really interesting because the, the, the characters that they had at the moment didn't really have any major way of doing damage to him. Uh, the, the, the priest had, had a smite, essentially, but he had lost it on a crit fail, um, he rolled two natural ones because he had advantage. He used luck point to give himself advantage on the casting, and he still rolled two ones on it earlier in the campaign, and so he critically lost it, which meant which meant that in in Shadow Dark he has to do some sort of penance essentially to get it back because he's a priest, and so he had to um, so he he didn't know yet how to do that, and so he couldn't use that spell. He didn't have any other uh, damage dealing spells. He had turn on dead, but turn on dead only destroys them if they're under level 5, and this is a vampire, I think it was, yeah, level 6 or something like that. So he could hold it at bay, but he couldn't damage it. And the other character that was with them was um, Varya, and she had her curse, which gives her, I've, I've ruled it gives her magical weapon damage, plus 1 to hit, plus 1 damage, and give her half her level in terms of plus to hit and damage, uh, which is better, I think, than the Cursed Knight gets normally. But I just wanted to upgrade her, because she's a little bit weaker than the rest of the party in terms of power level. Um, so I gave her half her level in terms of plus uh, to hit and damage three times per day for three rounds each. But she had already used all of them for her fight, or I think she had used, maybe she had one left, but she had used most of them in her fight um, at Yester Hill and hadn't rested since then. So she was, she was, I mean, she had three rounds where she could even damage the thing because, you know, it's a vampire, so it only takes damage from magical sources. And so she could give herself magical damage for three rounds. And she did, and she got it low, but she didn't kill it. And meanwhile, um, it was being held, and then he had two spells. He had hell, whole, uh, Turn Undead and Command, and he was switching off between them and trying to get it to not leave. But they couldn't really get it, especially when um, it was freed one round. It, uh, he lost focus on Command, and he cast Turn Undead and failed. It leapt on, I think it leapt on him or Varya and bit and drained hit points and, and healed itself. And so they were like, oh my goodness, we can't kill this thing. Um, and then finally, he rolled a like a crit success or something on his turn on dead, and it rolled badly enough that it was turned, and so it just ran because he kept failing. That's right, he got, he kept commanding it, but he kept failing his turn on dead, and so uh, he kept saying kneel for its command, and so it was stuck there. But then he uh, he would try to turn on dead, and it would run. So he uh, finally he finally it failed, and it ran off into the darkness. And they were like, let it go because we can't fight that thing. So it was a really creepy moment. On the one hand, the one part of the city they had this like battle mage destroying a vampire and like one bomb uh, as he broke through the chains. It was very like anime cinematic in, in, in my mind. Uh, and then on the other side of the town, uh, you had them like desperately trying to hold this thing off as it was getting closer and commanding it and holding the holy symbol up. And it was very also cinematic, but without like a combat really. Anyway, the two groups met up and they realized that Kresik had gotten into a major problem. And so they basically said, okay, we need to hole up for the night and just try to survive the night because bad things are happening here in Kresik. So they did. They went to Abner, Watcher Abner's house. They sealed it up as best they could, and they rested the night. And they talked to Esmeralda about what she knew. They told her what they knew. Kylan added a little bit of his own information, and then they went up, uh, and then they all slept the night. The next day, during the day, Abner said, I'm going to gather as many people from Kresik as I can, and I'm going to get up to the Abbey by, the, by nightfall. So you guys I know have to go there right now. You want to head there right now. That's fine. I'm going to stay in town and gather as many survivors as I can and get out of here. And they were like, okay, because during the day they felt comfortable with him doing that. They're like, we've dealt with Yester Hill. We've killed a lot of the witches. Um, vampires aren't going to come out during the day. We don't know if there's other undead around, but we think we're, we think we're okay. And so they did. 
they they just left him there with the other uh with well with not really any other survivors they just left him there and they went off to the abbey of saint markovia it was a really great uh moment of like reprieve a little bit the morning came and they felt like almost a sigh of relief as nothing had happened during the night so they rode up the abbey of saint markovia and on the way, they met up with Brom, Brom Mardikov, who had said he would be on the lookout for them. Uh, and so that was the end of one of the sessions, and we started the next session. And Brom approached them and said, hey, there's some stuff going on at the Abbey. First of all, most of the monks are, like, covered up in bandages, uh, and it looks like they're sick. And I haven't seen the abbot the whole time I've been watching the Abbey for you. And there are lots of people going into the Abbey. Lots and lots of people going into the Abbey grounds, like, to survive. Uh, you know, like, lots of people from the surrounding towns and farms. Like they, they're holding holding up in the abbey, um, it looks like. I mean, it's it looks fine so far. There's no violence or anything breaking out, but it looks like it's not a great place. Stuff stuff's happening there too. Uh, and he said, I, "You know, I haven't seen your friends." Oh no, no, I, I saw your friends. That's right, they're there. Yeah, yeah, uh, Irina and Frilsha, Irina and her friend from Velaki who had come ahead of them. They're like, "Oh yeah, yeah, they're there." He's like, "I saw them up top, uh, up in the abbey itself." But I've also seen, by the way, just so you know, I've been watching it during the day and during the night. And during the night, there are these boxes going in. People are delivering crates to the Abbey at night. And, and then they bring them out, and, they, and he said, they look lighter coming out than they look going in. And they're like, wait, so they look lighter going... Oh, coffins, vampires, for sure. That's what they thought. Well, it turns out it was just bodies. But they thought it was going to be just coffins or vampires. They're like, oh, great. Okay. And well, the first thought was, okay, maybe they're kidnapping people and taking them out. But then he said, no, it looks like it's lighter going out than in. So they're like, okay, so they're bringing something in. Oh, they must be bringing bodies. Oh, it's probably vampires. So they were going into the Abbey of St. Markovia for, forewarned that something was wrong there. And I, and I was glad that they, they, they had set that up. They said, Brom, why don't you go watch the Abbey? And it paid off. They knew that there were bad things going on. They knew in particular about the crates. They knew about, you know, just the things that were happening before they went there. And it paid off for them. Um, so Brahm said, hey, I'm not going there. <laughs> I might come back to the Abbey in a few days. I'll take messages from, uh, from you back to uh, Velaki. Do you need anything? And they were like, yeah, tell them this, tell them that. Uh, we, we rescued Esmeralda. Um, figure out what's going on back in Velaki and report. And he was like, all right. So he flew off. They went to the Abbey, <clears throat> and they found that the monks had... Uh, indeed let people into the grounds below, but they weren't letting basically anybody up to the abbey itself. And there were a handful of monks who were helping to minister to the people who were trying to organize them, get them supplies, you know, rations and ration and things like that. But most of the monks were not down there. And as they approached the abbey, they were told, hey, there is this disease going around. Uh, like, it, it, it seems like leprosy. But it's not catching... The monks who haven't caught it initially haven't caught it now. It's not spreading, so you're not in any danger. And they were like, yeah, right, but that's not how leprosy works. So whatever it is, it's not that. But as they went up, they did in fact see monks who were totally bandaged up, you know, all but their eyes or a little, just a little bit of their, of their faces visible. And, and a couple of the minnows had really yellow eyes. And they were like, uh-oh, that's not a good look. But they... they met a couple monks who seemed fine. And Brother Kylan was like, yeah, I didn't mention that because I didn't think there was any reason to tell you. Um, you know, it's not a big deal. Uh, I'm, I haven't caught it. Uh, Brother Vasily hasn't caught it. Uh, there are a handful of us who haven't caught it at all. And it's, it's really just the, 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 the abbot and those around him. And they were like, okay, great. So they went to see the abbot. Now, I, uh, you know, as, as written in Curse of Strahd, the abbot is like an angel who has come to Barovia and been stuck here. He has gone mad and he's trying to help Strahd. So I wanted to keep some elements of that, and I didn't want to keep others. I wanted to keep the idea that he had slowly gone mad, and he was a holy man who had lost his, his, you know, like purity of intention or purity of will or purity of thought or something like that. But I didn't want to make him an angel. I just didn't fit. So instead, what I did was I made him like an ancient, or not an ancient, but like he was a, a foreigner who had come here and had settled in the abbey and had become the abbot. In his previous life, he had been like an alchemist. And so as things started to go wrong here, he had decided to try to find ways of dealing with the dead and the undead and finding um, ways of bringing and protecting his people. And he had turned to alchemy and maybe some little bit of dark magic. And so I wanted to keep the body horror element from the book, but I didn't want to do like mongrel folk and like half alligator people. So I decided to do golems and then this idea of leprosy, that they were, you know, that, the, that, that there had been a, 
a mistake made in one of the alchemical rituals and it had spread this horrifying cursed disease thing to, the, to those who were present during it or those who were immediately nearby, but not beyond that. And so that's what happened. They met the abbot and he was, I had him dressed in like, you know, a, a gold mask. I was picturing basically um, Darkest Dungeon, the, le the leper from uh, Darkest Dungeon. And uh, he was wearing a gold mask and he was stuck in bed and he was rasping in his voice and he, and they basically started talking to him and negotiating and he told them quite a lot about what he knew. And then they said, hey, we have the book. We have the book and we need you to help, you need your help reading it. And he's like, well, I can't read it. I don't have eyes that work anymore, but I, I can help you read it. And Titus was like, okay, I think I can probably help piece it together. And so Titus and the abbot were like, we will sit here and we'll work through this whole book of the book of the Tome of Strahd and we'll figure everything out. We'll figure out what we can do to face him, what he is, all of that. And that was so fine so far as it went. And the party was like, yeah, we have to do that. But then the party was also like, look, we don't, we don't know what's going on. Where are our friends? Where are our friends? And he's like, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't know what's going on in the Abbey anymore. I've been, I've been in this room by myself essentially for days now. And people come in, my, my monks come in and, and bring me things, but they don't tell me what's going on anymore. Now, there were two monks in attendance on him. They were completely bandaged from head to toe without any visible skin or eyes or anything. And they were completely mechanical in their motions. They were making the same motions over and over. They were both holding censers full of incense and they were incensing the room and making it smell not horrible. And they were the, that's all they did. And so when, you know, one of the characters, Arthur, like bumped into it to try to see what it would do, it like stumbled a little bit, but then went immediately back without recognizing, without making any motion of recognition that he was there. And they were like, these are, these are definitely not living, right? They're not living. And so the, the priest raised his holy symbol to turn undead and they didn't, it didn't affect them. He rolled really high. It didn't affect them. So, like, so it's not undead. Okay. Well, they were golems and they had been you know, brought to life by alchemy and science and electricity and all this stuff. So they weren't undead. They weren't spirits. They weren't turnable, but they were they were certainly not living. And so that's what they, they asked him, oh, are these monks dead? And he was like, yes. And they were like, what are they? And he was like, the products of my hubris or something like that. I can command them, so don't, do not be afraid or something like that. And they were like, oh, great. The monk, the, the dying abbot has these golems, that flesh golems that he's created that he can control. Well, it turns out that he had also, well, he told them, do not go down into the crypts. Do not go into the crypts. It was like a command. You can't go down there. I, I give you free reign of the abbey. You can do what you'd like. You can do research. You can rest here. Don't go into the crypts. And they were like, huh, well, we're, you know, okay, fine, but we're going to go into the crypts. I mean, they didn't say that to him. They said that to each other. They're like, we're going into the crypts, right? Well, so they went to find their friends, Irina and Frilsha, and they weren't anywhere. They couldn't find them. And Irina's, or Frilsha's brother, who was a monk there, Brother Vasily was like, I haven't seen my sister in weeks. What are you talking about? And they're like, you, dude, we know that you've seen her. We know that she was here. And he seemed like he was like, I, I, me, uh, no, I, I, maybe I dreamed about her, but I didn't see her. So he obviously had some mental block and they're like, this is definitely vampires. This is definitely vampires. This is definitely vampires. Um, and then there was this yellow eye thing and they were like, okay, uh, yellow eyes. It seems like that has some, something to do with this as well. Now, uh, I think that was the end of one of the sessions. Or no, that was what happened was, they, that's right, they gathered everybody and they were like, Brother Kylan, we need you to go and figure out where Irina and Frilsha are. Because you're a monk here and you can figure it out. And he's like, sure, I'll go and figure it out. You guys wait here. And he goes into the, the abbey and just doesn't come back out. And they're like, great. So they go into the abbey after him and they find him dead in the courtyard or in the, uh, in the sort of inner, inner uh, solarium. He's been pushed from the upper level, broken neck, he's dead. And they're like, oh man. And it was really funny. The party didn't like Kylan. Remember, I mean, if you guys remember, Kylan was the guy, Brother Kylan was the witch burner in Kresik. He was the one who was rounding up people he thought was associated with the, with the witches there and killing them. And when they first met him, they're like, this guy is a, he believes what he's saying. He's a fanatic, a fan, a fanatic. He's, he's dangerous. We have to be careful about him. Um, and then they rescued him from the witches out in the, out in the uh, Yester Hill. And they were like, okay, he's, you know, he's, he's not bad or he's not, he's not on the devil's side, but he's the, he's a fanatic still. He's crazy. He's actually kind of worthless when he doesn't have his, his army of inquisitors around him. He's worthless. He's just a peasant, but his death really affected them. They were actually upset. They were like, man, we should have seen that coming. Here was a guy who for all of his faults, wasn't on the devil's side. He wasn't on Strahd's side and he wasn't involved in whatever this madness is at the Abbey. He could have helped us. He was normal. He wasn't affected by any of this stuff. Um, 
And the, the hags had said that they couldn't charm him or something like that, that he believed what he was saying, and they didn't like him. So he was clearly, could have been useful. Dang it. <laughs> oh, man. And, and like one of them was like, man, I wish we hadn't sent him in there alone. I wish we had kept him with us. I didn't even think about the fact that he would be in danger. And Anyway, that was where we ended one of the sessions uh, as well. That was great. That was super fun. And then um, <laughs> when we got back, they were like, okay, we need to deal with whatever is going on in the Abbey right now. We need to deal with it. And at that point, it was in the evening, and Abner had arrived from Kresik with all of the survivors. So he, he arrived into the Abbey grounds, and he came up to meet them. He was like, hey, I'm here. I've brought my people to Kresik. They're safe, as safe as they can be. I want to help you. You guys are doing something important. I need to help you. I, 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 you know, I, <laughs> I need, I can, I'm valuable. And they were like, great, you're on board. So they got a hireling, basically. They got a henchman. Uh, Abner is now their kind of frontline muscle. I'm using the gladiator stat block, although I'm dropping the, uh, from Shadow Dark, although I'm dropping the AC down. So he's only got AC 12. But he otherwise is just the gladiator stat block. And he's now fighting alongside them. And that's really good, because what happened next, they needed him. So this entire time, Titus uh, Esmeralda and the abbot with those two creatures have been going through the book. And so the other party members, now with Abner, decided to go down into the crypts. Before they did, they went to the abbot and they told him, hey, Kylan's dead. Um, to a, a girl and her, um, our two, two companions, uh, Irina and Felsha, and their, their handmaiden, they're, she's, they've gone missing. They were in the abbey. What's going on? And the monk was like, the, the abbot was like, okay. Um, my first creation, my first successful creation was a monk, Brother Cyrus. And he, or brother, um, no, it was a, I forget what his name, I forget, I forget, it was, it was one of the Bellevues, basically, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, Cyrus, but it was one of the Bellevues. Um, and he said, uh, brother so-and-so, I brought him back, and uh, he's, he is the one who I taught all my secrets to, he's the one who is currently doing alchemy, because I can't do it since the, the, the thing. He wasn't affected. He has been, he also can control these creatures. Um, Perhaps he's the one that killed Brother Kylan. Perhaps he's the one who took your, your companions. Because I haven't done it. And they believed the abbot. They were like, yeah, we, we, we actually believe you. We don't think you're the one involved in this. And they were like, all right, so we have to go down to the crypts to rescue Irina and Frilsha and the, and the handmaid. Um, they are our Frilsha servant. Who, it was kind of a running gag. None of us could remember her name. Even I couldn't remember her name. I kept having to check my notes. Um, Weskovna was actually her name, I think. Weskovna, they called her. But uh, still, <laughs> it was like, uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't remember her name. So it was just Irina Frilsha and uh, Frilsha's servant, I kept saying. But they all agreed that Titus needed to keep reading because the abbot has, his days are numbered. Very, I mean, maybe in terms of hours, not days, how much time he has left. And they were like, okay, so we've got to, we've got to spend the time that we have reading through this book because you can't read it without him and he can't read it on his own. So Titus, you, Esmeralda, stay with the abbot, keep translating. We will go down and try to rescue Irina. So I had set up the fight ahead of time, and I expected there to be a fireball at advantage at least once in the fight. I mean, I expected there to be some death. So it was a dangerous fight that was down there. There were a grand total of four flesh golems, which if you know in uh, Shadow Dark are nothing to sneeze at. Plus, uh, Brother, uh, I think it was, um, well, Brother Bellevue, I'll just say, uh, who was sort of a, a kind of a flesh golem, although he wasn't in the same stat block, and he, I gave him more like mage abilities, but I flavored them as alchemy, so he could like splash um, bottles of lightning and stuff like that, or he had like a, a lightning um, uh, little, little um, device, and he had like you know bottles of acid and things like that that he could throw, uh, and little bottles of alchemist fire, basically. And so uh, it was a, it would like, it was going to be a tough fight. So they went down into the first level of the crypt and they um, faced one flesh golem and it it was like they, they took they took it they killed it it wasn't a big deal I mean it was a big deal but they killed it pretty quickly a couple rounds of combat and they saw how dangerous it could be especially when it went crazy because I had it um, I changed the stat blocks a little bit so that it did a little bit um, had a little, little lower chance to hit um, maybe like I think I think I dropped it by one or two and so it was. But it was dangerous because when it went crazy, it got extra damage and it would smash the target it was attacking. And so it could really kill you in one round if, if you were unlucky, if it got a crit, or uh, if you just didn't kill it after that one round. So like, it was a very dangerous opponent. And they're like, okay, we got one. And then they moved into the room beyond the, the room where the lab was, the alchemy lab that had been set up in the crypts. And there were two of them guarding the entrance. And they could see that this was sort of a dissection room or like a preparatory room for the lab. And there was a table with Frilsha's servant who had been kind of cut open on it. And there were 
books and you know beakers and it was definitely like a, a lab or part of a laboratory um, and then there were these two unmoving you know golems on either side of the door to the room beyond and they could hear gagged you know yelling or uh, screaming and they could hear a guy laughing and talking about how he was going to create um, his his bride he was going to create um, uh, Vanya or Var Varenka or whatever or he, was, he was gonna he was gonna create his, his bride. so he had gone crazy basically he was going to create uh, and he had taken Irina because he was going to use part of her to make this flesh golem so there was a there was a fourth flesh golem two at the door the one they had already fought and one in the room that was tied down and it was kind of like half complete so they decided they had to go for it and they went for it now before they had gone down i had the abbot bless their weapons and he had blessed them with like uh extra d6 damage um and it lasted for like 24 hours or 10 hours or something like that so they could well, that had it for the whole fight and that was very valuable because it it was the difference between success and failure i also ruled that if the uh, the flesh golems had an ac of like I don't know, like 14 or 13. And I ruled that if you if you hit within five, if you rolled within five of their AC, so their AC and, and four above it, then um, you only, they were resistant to your damage. But if you rolled above that, you got like the, the weak vital points and so you would you'd actually do full damage. And so um, with, with non-magical weapons. And so Abner's sword was enchanted. I think that was the only one that was enchanted. And, uh, and they were all blessed. Um, so they had a extra luck token. But... Um, but they had to deal with that, so it was a it was a rough fight. I mean, by the end of it, uh, the 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 only reason they won, really, the only reason they won, was that I was doing simultaneous initiative, because in the round that uh, Ulysses the priest went down, he had chosen to cast cure wounds, and so I I had them both occur simultaneously. So he went to zero and healed himself on the same turn. So he went back up. That was the only reason he didn't go down, because if he had gone down, they would have had no healing. And they would have died. That they would have all died, especially Arthur, as uh, because Arthur went down. By the end of the fight, Arthur had gone down to one constitution. He was at one because of my dual system of health and constitution. He had been down. He had <laughs> he had one hit point left, and uh, they literally had to rush because I I rule that every round you're unconscious, your constitution drops by one if you're in that state. And so he was bleeding out at one constitution. If if Ulysses had failed his cure wounds check. Arthur would have been dead. But Arthur was healed, and so his hit points went back up, but he was at one constitution. And about halfway through the fight, um, Brother Bellevue came out and started th hurling his things. And what I, what I said was that he had these lightning bottles, these bottles of, like, basically, like... And so he'd throw them, the, 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 the flesh golems would grapple you, and they would start to hit you, and he would throw it at the flesh golem, and it would heal the flesh golem and damage you. So he was like this little bundle of damage and healing, and they were like, we gotta kill this guy. So they focused fire on him, and they managed to get him to go to rush back to the other room to free the last flesh golem, which was this bride that he was creating. And he was trying to unstrap it and free it, and they got to him and killed him before he could. And so then they just killed the last one as it was strapped down. But it was such a close fight. I mean, again, Ulysses almost died, Arthur almost died, and if Ulysses had gone down, it's very likely at least Arthur, probably, maybe, maybe Arvaria, and I know who knows Abner, but like the, the party could have been, it could have been a TPK, except for the fact that Titus wasn't down. But it could have been, uh, and it would have been real bad. But they managed to pull it out, and it was like, I didn't pull any punches. Um, I just was like, look, this is what's down there. They decide to go down there without their full complement. They know how dangerous it is. They know that these things are, once they fought the first one, they know what they're getting into. It's, you know, they're going into this with eyes open. So it was cool. It was really cool. And they managed to survive. It was a great fight. It was awesome because the, there was two great fights back to back. There was the fight, or back to back, a few sessions apart, but the two major, the two fights that they had done were the fight at Esther Hill, which was epic and close and intense, and they all had a good time. And then there was this one, which was epic and close and intense. Now, Titus had been sitting out the whole time, but what I was doing was I had a document with all of Strahd's stats and a bunch of information about Ravenloft and his backstory and history and stuff. And as, as the session was going on, I was feeding it to him. I was texting it to him on Discord privately. And so as the session was going on, he was getting more and more information. Even though he wasn't involved in the actual fight, he was still participating on his end by reading through it and doing all that stuff. So it was still cool uh, for him, I think. And he enjoyed it. And he kept sending, you know, uh, memes throughout the fight, too, to us, like, about what was happening. So he was he was engaged. He was interested. In, and later on, oh, we talked about it. And he was like, actually, that was super fun for me to watch it while I was getting more information. And I could, I could you know, look for the right meme and send it at the right moment. So he enjoyed it, even though he wasn't involved in the fight itself. 
But as he was getting information, he was getting Strahd's stats, he was getting his backstory, he was getting how to defeat him, and how Strahd can fully arise and all this stuff. So he got, he, he got by the end of that night, he had almost all the information, almost, all the information about Strahd that I had, um, which I wanted at some point to do. I wanted to give everybody, I wanted to give the party enough information so that they could, you know, enough mysteries, right? We've been playing since September, <laughs> right, since the end of September. They have had no idea what's going on for a good portion of that. They finally started to get some clues. I wanted to just give them what was going on. Here's what Strahd's is. Here's what he's doing. Here's how he's going to try to do it on his own timeline and, and in his own way. And who knows, you know, beyond that. And there were some details they didn't know, but I gave them a lot. Anyway, they rescued Irina. They rescued Frilsha. They found out that the, the, uh, the stuff that was being, that there was this alchemy, alchemical stuff that was being made that, kind of mimicked the vampire's enchantment. It was this gold liquid. Um, it had the consistency of blood, but it was gold. And uh, it, if you consumed it, it seemed like um, it put you in this sort of soporific, uh, susceptible state. Now, they never figured it out what it was or where it was coming from. It was coming from the vampires. It was coming from the cult. They had infiltrated through one of the brothers, Brother Halleck. They had infiltrated the, the monastery. They had influenced... Uh, Brother Bellevue, and they had helped him create this stuff, and it was basically like spreading uh, through the monks that was spreading this mind control stuff. But with this blow, they had stopped it. So basically, the the the, the leprosy curse had spread through Moni, most of the monks and killed off many of them, was killing off the rest. Those who were unaffected were being enchanted, and so Vasily was enchanted. Kylan hadn't been around, so he wasn't affected, but Halleck was, and a handful of the others were as well. So essentially, it was... Um, yeah, it was, it was, they were trying to tear down the, the, the abbey. Uh, the, the cult was, and strawed through the cult. So they returned. Irina, Frilsha, Vasily. Um, uh, Vasily had been with them too. That's right, Brother Vasily went down with them. And I essentially just said, all he does is once per round he prays for you. And I rolled randomly for who he was praying for. And that person had advantage on what they tried to do that turn. So it was a really good boon. That's, uh, he had like four hit points and he never got targeted. Um... And they were like, we should seriously consider bringing this guy with us. If he can do this, just like every round. And I was like, yeah, that's what he does. All he does is he gives advantage to somebody else. Um, so they were like, man, we should seriously consider taking him with us. They ended up not. They left him back at the Abbey when they left. But still, Vasily could have provided uh, that as a sort of henchman boon, you know? <laughs> so that was the end of another session. Um, at the beginning of the next one, they went back up. Or I think they went back up and uh, talked a little bit. And then that ended. They decided that what they were going to do was they were going to rest up because they had to rest for a few days. Because Arthur was down to one constitution, they couldn't afford to rush right into things. They had to rest for a couple days. And so they did. They, they stayed in, in the abbey for a couple of days. Um, the abbot basically fell into a coma and was dying. And this is where something happened that I was not expecting so much. But it was an interesting, it was an interesting moment. I wanted it to be kind of a question but I didn't expect the outcome that actually happened. So uh, one of the monks who just was called Brother, he didn't, uh, he didn't have a name, he'd given up his name, so he was just Brother. And Brother Vasily came to Ulysses and they were like, hey, the abbot's dying. There is a rule here. Um, it's been passed down since the abbey was founded. There, always, there must always be an abbot. There must always be an abbot. Um, we don't know exactly why. And the players had, had guessed that it's because the abbot seemed to have while the abbot was alive, it seems like the dark powers couldn't, like, the, for example, the fog couldn't cross the wall into the abbey itself. The abbey was a place of safety. The abbey was a place of light. Even though this other bad stuff had been happening, sort of supernatural evil, vampires and ghosts and undead couldn't enter the abbey grounds. So they were like, that's probably what this means. It's like it's a place of safety as long as there is an abbot. It's more of the office than the man sort of thing, where he, it's not the holiness or the goodness of the man who's doing it. It's sort of the, the, the fact that there is an abbot who has that title and that, that power given through the title. So they were like, there has to be. And really, there are only two of us here. <laughs> There's this brother who is ancient. He's like, you know, uh, like 80 years old and, you know, kind of hobbles around and very, very weak. And then there's Vasily, who's been a monk for like a month or like a year, who, uh, who is just brand new uh, and, and like has no experience. And like, he's, he's like, what should we do? And they look to Ulysses to decide because he's a priest. He's shown to be um, powerful. He's, he's uh, you know, he was negotiating with the abbot. The abbot seemed to show him deference while he was alive. And, and so Ulysses is like, I don't know. What do we do? 
we have to have an abbot. It makes sense. We have to protect these people who have all come here for refuge. There were now, by now, like a few hundred people in the abbey grounds. And they were like, what do we, what do, we do here? And one of the monks vastly looked at Ulysses and said, oh, you, you could be the abbot. I mean, the, the rule, the requirement is that you never leave. The, once, once the abbot is, is made the abbot, he cannot leave the abbey grounds. And Ulysses was like, oh man, that's a really cool moment. That's a really cool story moment for my character. Uh, this guy who doesn't really have faith, doesn't really believe in stuff. He served as a monk when he was a younger guy, but now he you know, kind of fell away because he was rich. And then he came to Barovia to save his, or he came to the lands, the continent to save his cousin and didn't really believe in all the supernatural stuff. And now, you know, has come to believe very strongly. His, his belief is strong enough that he can pray and have these effects. And now he's come to the abbey and they need a, an abbot. It's kind of a perfect arc for him. But the party was like, yeah, but if you leave, we will lose a very powerful tool against the undead. And it was this huge moment. And so it was kind of like a character moment versus player moment where the player was like, look, I, I really want to, to have this be his arc. I really want Ulysses to become the abbot here. Um, maybe we could go and come back. Maybe the abbot will survive long enough for that. Maybe we can make brother the abbot for a few, <laughs> like a year or two, and then he'll die and then I'll take over. Um, but at the end of the day, Ulysses said, I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay and be the abbot here. And the party was eventually resigned to it. And he said, I'll make a new character and we'll introduce him and we'll do all that stuff, but I really think I want to do this. And so it wasn't how I expected it. I expected it to be like, okay, which do we pick, brother or, or Vasily? Or, or do we just let this go? That's kind of what I expected. And then like the offer of, of the abbot to Ulysses was like, oh, that's an interesting idea, but no. But no, he went for it. He took it. Um, and that meant that they were down Ulysses. And for the rest of the campaign, they, they, they don't have Ulysses. And Ulysses has been a very important character in terms of their party communication, in terms of their planning, in terms of their power against the undead. So it was a major, like, what are we going to do? So, yeah, very interesting. So the rest of the party rested, recuperated. Um, they met with Brahm again, and they told him what was going on. He told them what was going on in Velaki, and he said that they have a friend who wants to meet them. Your, your old friend, uh, Blinsky, would like to meet you. And, and my father... And uh, Ritavio, they both say that he's, uh, yeah, they, they want you to meet him. And the party was like, oh no, what does that mean? Well, of course, they didn't know that he was actually Rudolf Van Richten. But, you know, I was, uh, uh, <laughs> I was planning on revealing it when they got back to Velaki. It was perfect, actually, because what I just said was, oh, to, to the character Ulysses, or to, to the player, I said, um, okay, what if you're uh, Rudolf Van Richten's apprentice or something, like a monster hunter along with him? And so that way, when they meet him, they can also meet you. And he was like, oh, that's great. That's perfect. So that's what we did. We just had him be, he's another cleric again, or another priest, I should say. But he's sort of like the apprentice of um, Van Richten. And so when they finally met him, uh, they also met the other character. And it gave them a reason to trust Van Richten. It was a little meta, but they're like, okay, well, if the other player is his apprentice, then he probably is trustworthy. Um, but that was, you know, they tried not to act on that or act that way. But that was the way that it was. Now, one of the things that Brom told them about was this. The Festival of the Blazing Sun. I found this online and I decided to use it. So he brought them this um, this little uh, pamphlet. And he said, hey, yeah, the Baron's men have been putting this up all over. Or yeah, the Count. It says the Baron here, but it actually is the Count. Um, the Count of Loki. Um, he's been putting it up all over the place. And they were like, oh, no, what is this? Ugh. And then they were like, attendance and children required? Oh, no, this is just the worst thing that has ever happened. Something obviously horrible is going to go down. Uh, we have to stop it. We have to stop it, right? But that was it. They were like, we have to, there's no choice. We have to stop this. So um, they, they said we have to get back because it was like four days or five days away. So that we have to get back to this. Um, they spent a couple of those days resting in, in town. Uh... Let's see, I'm trying to think of what else happened. This is a while ago now, because we've been playing for a bit. So they they spent some time in town. That, oh, that's right. They, they they decided that Esmeralda and Abner would stay with them. And then Varya, Titus, and Arthur would move on. Ulysses would stay with Irina, Frilsha, Vasily, and uh, and the, the, the other Watchers that were remaining behind. They brought three Watchers with them, although they kind of didn't do much with them. They just kind of were like, hey, uh, Abner, why don't you bring some of your men? And they were, he was like, okay. And he brought three dudes with him. Um, but then those guys got left behind in Velaki anyway. So anyway, they, they went forward. They they left the abbey. It was a very moving moment where they all said goodbye to to Ulysses, especially Arthur, because you know they have their cousins in came and uh, uh, the players are related. And it was this great moment of like, They've been together from the beginning. They, you know, that's uh, Arthur was saved by Ulysses finding him, and they've been looking for Arthur's brother all the way in the whole time. And like, it's, it was just a really great moment of like, hey, you know, 
I'll, I'll see you later, man. You know, I'll be back. Um, so they left. One of the things that I said was that uh, because of Ulysses' prayers, basically back at the Abbey, the players, every player is once per game um, allowed to try, once per day, I should say, is allowed to try turn undead, regardless of their class or regardless of the situation. They can try to do it. Um, and basically, it's his inter intervention. <laughs> They're praying, praying, but he's, help he's helping them. So that was one of the benefits that Ulysses gave them for staying behind. Um, but otherwise, it's not much. I mean, he's just, it's, it's a story moment rather than a character moment, or rather than like a meta game moment. <laughs> it was a character moment. So they rode back to uh, Velaki. And in order to get there, they had to skip Kresik because they didn't want to go through Kresik. They had been told that they had fallen to the undead, basically, and that everything was really bad on the roads. And so they... Um, they found a, a ferry that took them across the river at a different place, a different point. Uh, it was, uh, let's see, where was the ferry? It was like, um, oh yeah, Bukora, uh, right down here. The, the ferry had taken them across the river, and they um, they got to the road, and some creepy stuff happened on the road, like they found a, a, a caravan of, of farmers that had obviously been trying to make it to Velaki, and they had all been killed, um, and they were being feasted on by corpses. Uh, by zombies basically and they were like we don't nope 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 get involved with it we could we could take them we could fireball a bunch of them we could try to fight them but it's not worth it they're dead let's ride on so they, they, they rode around them and the corpses of the zombies just kept eating them they rode through villages and and they found that most of them had been destroyed they went through one varash this one here and they saw that it hadn't been destroyed but at each of the the the, the four entrances into the city or the town uh on the road the 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 uh, basically a very primitive flag had been erected with the symbol of, of the House Ravenloft, the symbol of, of Strahd. And so the people of Varesht had, had accepted him as their, as their uh, master, and they had been, they had been spared. And so the, 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 while the rest of the towns had been torn apart, the rest of the villages had been torn apart, Varesht was not. There were barricades set up and the town itself was okay, but it wasn't destroyed. And so they were like, okay, well, great. Uh, this is bad stuff is happening all around Velaki. They skipped Varesht and rode along the road further down to Slobodia. When they got there, they saw that the town had been burned to the ground. And in the ruins, they found, um, or I, maybe it was at Kanatina, but in one of these two villages, they, they found an outrider from Velaki. It was Izek, Izek Strazny, who was riding around trying to you know, hunt down undead and, and figure out what was going on during the day. And uh, they talked to him, and he was, uh, basically he was like, hey there, uh, um, what are you guys doing? And they, they told him they were enemies of the devil, and he was like, okay, good. And they were like, we're going back for the festival. And he was like, oh, good, all will be well. And they were like, does he mean that? And I was like, there's not a hint of irony in his voice. He believes all will be well in Velaki, or all is well in Velaki, all will be well. And they're like, okay, so this guy is, he's drank the Kool Aid. He's really loyal to the Count, but he is pretty wicked. And they knew that from before, they knew that he was pretty brutal. And then when they got to Velaki and they asked about him, they were like, yeah, he's, he's brutal. Um, someone said he was born for times like this, and they're like, "Oh, that's a bad, that's a bad description of a guy, for a guy in a world like this." Um, so they didn't, they didn't like him very much, <laughs> and they were like, "We could just kill him now." They're like, "No, no, maybe he'll be useful later because he's not, he's you know, he's opposed to the devil, so who knows what it will do." So they got back to Velaki and they found um, their old allies again, Riktavio, Erwin Martikov, um, and then they met Van Richten and his new apprentice. Um, who, whose apprentice's name is Ansgar. He's a, a priest. Um, and that was played by the character, or by the player, who played Ulysses. And they had a big sit-down session and a conversation about what was going on. They told uh, him everything they knew. He told them everything he knew, which was, hey, the, the cult is operating in the town. It's being led by Fiona Wachter. Wachter. Um, the son of the Count is involved with it. He serves the devil. Uh, the Festival of the Sun is definitely a trap. Something bad is going to happen there. I don't know what. Um, the... Order of the Silver Scale are not trustworthy exactly, but I do know that they are somehow, they're protected from enchantment and from charm effects. They can't be, they can't be uh, beguiled. Um, whatever they're serving is protecting them. So they could be a very useful ally against the devil because one of his primary methods of, of entrapment is that charm. Is, and he and his minions, they, 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 they break the minds of those that they fight. And so because the Order of the Silver Scale seemed to be protected from that, they might be useful. But he sort of said, like, they might be useful idiots. Like, they're, they're, they're really not, they're not f going to be trustworthy. They're things, they're like, he's like, they're like a mad dog. If we can point it in the right direction, right? That's all we have to do. Point it in the right direction and let it bite. Um, we just hope it doesn't bite us, basically. But he's like, I can handle it. I, I know the words. I know how to command a dog. I know how to do it. <laughs> and so he was very confident, Van Richten was. I mean, perhaps overconfident. But they, they were like, all right, whatever. He said, I know where Baba is. 
Baba is, uh, and he kind of explained what she was, one of the devil's lieutenants way back when. She's sort of uh, taken on the old worship of the Lady of Ladies of the Wood or the Lady of the Wood as um, as just like a, a way of getting in the minds of the people. But she's not. She's not that ancient. She's just a, a hag, essentially a very powerful witch who has extended her life and is serving the devil here. And uh, she's, she's dangerous. She's very dangerous. But you've, you've given her a powerful setback in the West by killing her tree and burning her tree and... She's, she's very unlikely to uh, be able to assist him quickly. So if we want to strike the castle quickly, we could, and we won't have to deal with her as well. And she's a very powerful foe. So if we, can, if we could do that, well, we could strike quickly. He said, if we don't, what we probably want to do is split an attack so that she is attacked first, or she is attacked simultaneously with the castle. And then, of course, there's this festival coming up. And so they discuss what to do. They were like, well, could we, could we go get the Sun Sword? Could we go fight her could we deal with the festival and then go fight her and then do it. they had lots of permutations of what their plan was should we should we go meet with the Vokters because we could try to get the township on our side and get maybe we could go talk to Izek and try to convince him that, to fight with us and there were just lots of things that they could do and I told them by the way so that they, they knew at this point too that Baba had the icon of Ravenloft and they had discovered that what it does is it refreshes the souls of those who pray before it for a certain time basically uh, you can you pray for a uh, as an uh, out of combat, maybe 10 minutes, um, you can get the benefits of a long rest once per person. And in the castle, that would be insane. They're like, oh, that's so good. You get the benefits of a long rest, get all of our spells back, heal to full, maybe get some of our constitution back and maybe get some of our stress healed. Uh, that would be so valuable. But they're like, oh, but that involves us going way out of our way and we have to go deal with Baba and who knows, that'll be dangerous. And then there's this festival. And then, of course, during this whole time, Strahd's getting more powerful. Obviously, the valley is, 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 is fading quickly. Velaki itself, I, in my mind, I had the image from the Castlevania anime uh, where the city is like barricaded and the, the winged creatures are attacking it every night. That's what's happening to Velaki now. Uh, there are you know, stakes of the thing's heads and the people are, are, are harried and, and terrified and the, the town's guards are on the walls and, and every night there are these things that fly over the walls and get into the town or attack the gates. And So Velaki is like on its last legs. It's not doing well and they're like, we have to act quickly. So they decided, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to get the, the Order of the Silver Scale because they hadn't trusted them. They didn't interact with them. They're like, we're going to try to, through Van Richten, who has had some contact with them, have them disrupt or affect the Festival of the Sun, of the Blazing Sun, and we will go to Ravenloft at the same time, that day, because they knew that the cult would be active in Velaki at the time. And they know, they know that there's about 100 cult members in, in Barovia around there. And they're like, well, a good number of them will probably be in Velaki for this festival. So if we go during the day of the festival, not only will it be day, and so the, the, the bad stuff in Ravenloft will hopefully be more quiet or more asleep or less engaged and less active, but also the cult, which is operating out of Ravenloft, will be at least partially diminished by their numbers going to Velaki. They're like, great, that's a really, really good idea. <laughs> so that's what, in fact what they did. They, they waited until the morning, they got some supplies, they, they made some last preparations, and then they went to Ravenloft. Now they had been told that, that the Count doesn't allow anybody he hasn't invited into his castle. And that was the old tradition, is that the, the, the mists of Ravenloft, the mists near Ravenloft choke any who are uninvited. They didn't know how true that was, but they were like, we better not risk it. So let's just bring, because they had been having these dreams of Strahd saying to them, come, bring my sister, bring the book, come. Because of course, Strahd is inhabiting the body of Ismark. His spirit is. So bring my sister means bring Irina. So he had, they had been invited, and so they were like, all right, well, let's, let's take, let's go, those of us who have been invited. And basically that was the party, the four of them. And, you know, there's a little hand-waving here because why would Ansgar be invited? Why would Van Richten be invited? But they really wanted to bring them, and I was like, well, maybe he wants to deal with everybody in one fell swoop. So all the major threats. So he invited all of them uh, in their dreams. So Ansgar... The, the uh, Arthur, Ulysses, Titus. Um, oh, Ulysses is not there, but Arthur, Titus, Arvaria, um, Ansgar, Van Richten, Esmeralda, and Abner. He didn't invite Abner specifically, but Abner was like, I'm part of your household, right? And a, a noble invites a person, he invites their household or their servants. And so Abner was like, uh, I was like, yeah, that's reasonable, right? So so Abner is, is kind of their retainer, which means he is uh, invited by proxy. But they didn't, they didn't bring anybody else. They left the three other... Watchers that they had brought with them from Kresik, they left them behind to protect the Blue Water Inn. Rictavio stayed behind. 
um, the uh, the two Mardikovs stayed behind, and uh, and the the uh, Order of the Silver Scale, none of them came, none of them were involved. So they they never even went for the Sun Sword. They never went to uh, Vladimir Horngard. They never did any of that. They just completely left that on the side and were like, nope. Nor did they go and try to deal with the Vokters. I had Stella Vokter be a, uh, a mage that could have, if they could have awoken her, she could have been valuable, but they didn't go to see her at all. They were tempted. Varya was tempted that last day in town. They were like, they heard the story of this girl who had been learning magic before she'd fallen into this coma, the daughter of um, Fiona. And Fiona was clearly leading this devil cult. And she was like, mm, I wonder if I could do anything there. And she was half tempted to go and try to see her, which would have been awesome because way back when, when she had her dream about Velaki and all was not well, and she had those images of, you know, the people walking around in the dark, and then a girl had run forward in a nightgown and had shaken her and said, all is not well in Velaki, and then she had woken up. That was way back in the early parts of the campaign. Um, the piece of art that I used was the art that I was going to use for Stella. So if she had gone to see her, it would have been this great, like, full circle moment of like, oh man, this girl was important. But she never saw her, and so that never came up. That's okay. So anyway, then they decided to go to the castle, and they did. They rode off towards Castle Ravenloft, and it was a great moment. They rode through the dark early in the morning on the day of the festival. It was raining, but it wasn't raining too hard. It started to rain harder as the sun started to rise and the clouds got darker. Thunder started to roll. As they were going, as they were rolling for random encounters, I'm using the underclock die, um, and it got down to zero, or it got down to like negative one. But I didn't want them to fight something on the road. I was like, that's not... Or they can choose to fight it if they want. But anyway, I said they heard the sound of up ahead echoing uh, down the road because they were in kind of a windy canyon as they move up towards the castle. They heard the sound of horses and, and a heavy carriage maybe. They've, you know, they've heard that sound before. They've traveled, so they know what that sounds like. And they're like, uh-oh, let's get off the road. So they managed to hide, and, and this black carriage with black horses rode past at full gallop speed with no driver, riding along the main road towards Velaki. And they were like, man, did a vampire leave? In fact, it did. That was Escher. Um... But they were like, man, we could have, oh, dude, well, it's better that it's not, he's not, uh, better that whatever was in that carriage, they didn't know what it was, but they were like, better that whatever's in that carriage be at Velaki than up at the town. So let, I'm well, glad we let it pass. So then, And it didn't see them. So then they, they rode past it. And so I, because I was saying, well, they're going to have the Festival of the Sun. Uh, Escher was going to be there. It was going to be where they met him, right? Because the whole point was going to be the Festival of, of the Sun goes very, very badly. <laughs> it goes very, very badly. And that night, the vampires descend upon Velaki. That was what was going to happen. But um, that's not what happened. I mean, the players won't know. That all might be happening depending on what they're doing. <laughs> so anyway, they made it all the way to Ravenloft, no problem. And they entered the castle. Now, at this point... I think I'm going to stop the video here, and I might do another video, I'm not sure when, about the prep I've done for the castle, because I changed my mind about a lot of things. I kept a lot of the prep I had done, but I changed my mind about a lot of things I did, about how I was going to approach the castle in the first place. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it might be worth a full video on that. Plus, they've only gone through one session in the castle, and I imagine it'll be at least three, because they're going pretty slow um, in terms of both in-game time and... Uh, and in terms of how long it takes in the session to do what they're doing, because they're talking a lot and discussing a lot. And I'm fine with that. I don't try to, I try not to like penalize them in terms of time, but they're on a time clock because they're trying to do all this before nightfall. Um, yeah, so I'll talk about what I had prepared there and uh, what they're trying to do in Ravenloft in another video. So anyway, I hope this has been interesting. I mean, I covered a whole bunch of sessions pretty quickly because we did a whole bunch of stuff. But it was a lot of fun. I've been having so much fun with this campaign. The players have been, they've already said that whenever we finish this, they want to play another campaign. Not gothic horror, <laughs> but they're all on board um, for a new session. One of my players is leaving. He's going to college, so he won't be a free uh, or available after the summer. So he's probably not going to join the campaign, the next one that we do. But the other three players are all on board and very interested in continuing to play to see where it goes. Uh, well, certainly finishing off this campaign and then taking a break and then starting a new one. So I'm looking at already what I'm going to be running next. But uh, but for now, I finished all, I think I finished the last of my prep. I have completely finished the prep for the Castle of Ravenloft. I've finished all of my encounters. I've finished the, everything there. And I think once they finish that, that'll be the end of the story. So, you know, regardless of how it goes, if they all die, if it's a TPK, then that's the end of the story. Yeah, it's, it's unfortunate, but it's uh, it would be sad. If they manage to destroy Strahd, then that would be the end of the story. But if they manage, there's basically there are tiers of victory things that they can accomplish that will be more or less totally successful. And uh, I'll talk about that more in, in the next video if I go over the prep for the castle. 
All right, guys. Again, as I said, I hope this has been interesting, and I'll see you all in another video.